Well, I certainly couldn't answer that question. Maybe Phil can. Uh, it's a bit out of my area. I don't work for them. Uh, <laughs> um, and in fact, any, uh, any answer that I could give you uh, is uh, on NASA Watch or uh, you know, out in the press. I, I, Um, I have heard uh, that there is some discussion of um, uh, interacting with the Chinese to uh, at least explore whether it might be possible to make use of their uh, launch capabilities once the shuttle is retired. Yeah, um, and it's just, uh, I mean, it's, it's unconfirmed at this point. I don't know of any official uh, announcements along those lines, but uh, uh, again, it's a uh, case of engagement. Well, I, I believe that any future grandiose exploration like going to Mars has to be an international effort because for one country it's impossible to do it. So hopefully nations can cooperate to do such enterprise in the future. Would you repeat the question? Sure. If there was a gyro breakdown, was there uh, any way to recover the <coughs> Well, in that case, they would have to follow their route back, okay? The plan was never to come back the same way, but make a loop and explore new areas. So in case of a gyro breakdown, they would have to turn back and follow their tracks. Which, fortunately, on the moon, don't go away. <laughs> Nor would you be confused by anybody else's. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, could you both compare battery technology then and now? Could you compare battery technology then and now? Yes. Uh, the battery was, of course, a very critical item. And uh, we have tested many batteries and found that the silver zinc type battery was the highest energy efficiency, energy density battery. And we also had to design the battery such that there was a redundancy. So we divided it into two identical packages, and each of them was capable of driving the vehicle to its full capability. But uh, a silver zinc battery at the time was the best and I believe that probably still is the highest energy density, but uh, much too expensive for ordinary car use. And certainly what they're using, or what we're using uh, in the chariot, is a lithium ion. Uh, and a very high, den high energy density uh, to the point where uh, each of the battery packs um, has to be individually tested uh, by the safety lab. Uh, because of the amount of, of energy that you are packing into that small volume, so. How many do you use? Is it anything like a Tesla car? How many do you use? It is anything like a, a Tesla car. How many? Uh, how many batteries do you use? Oh, t for testing? Uh, well, we, we had to do, do first developmental testing to establish the characteristics of the batteries. Uh, then finally, when we nail down that this is the type and the size we want to use, then we had to go through a thermal vacuum type of a testing throughout simulating the complete mission from the cold lunar morning temperatures to the high temperatures, as well as the uh, the vacuum conditions. Now, batteries and electronics are very temperature sensitive. So we had to provide a cooling system for the battery and electronics. And we selected a passive cooling 
which consisted of a wax-like material which we put on top of the batteries and electronics. And as, as they warmed up during the use of the vehicle, the wax melted and the phase changing energy uh, was enough to complete a complete, like a 15 kilometer mission or so. Then they opened up the uh, radiator on top of this wax type uh, material and look at the cold sky. It dissipated the heat, the wax cooled down and solidified before going out for the next mission. So that was a, a kind of a clever way of taking advantage of the large energy absorption of phase changing of a material. And, in, and for, again, for the chariot, uh, if you look at the picture of the vehicle with just the two uh, astronauts, the two suited figures uh, on it, that entire deck is, uh, um, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 centimeters tall. That entire deck, uh, had, or most of that deck, has uh, battery packs within it. So I, I, don't know, I don't drive a Tesla, so I don't know the comparison. In the back. set of tires with the and springs, how much do they cost for a set? Oh, well, as far as cost is concerned, the total lunar rover project for Apollo cost $38 million. Now, In the 1960s. Well, of course, most of that was development cost. Now, once the development was completed, to duplicate a rover cost only one million dollar per copy. <laughs> uh, as far as just the wheels, I really couldn't break it down, but because you know it was a completely handmade wheel, it certainly wasn't cheap. Maybe and you have some idea about well, and, and the spring wheels um, are also currently uh, prototypes, so they're each handmade. Um, <clears throat> If you were to ask Goodyear um, if they'll sell you a pair or a set for your uh, ATV, uh, you might actually spur them to uh, uh, think about commercializing. So uh, that's a way of saying I don't know. <laughs> we're going to have one more formal question, and then we're going to have some informal questions in the uh, Yin Science Hall afterwards with refreshments. Uh, Mr. Lowry Watkins has provided some of them, and then we'll also have some uh, hot cider and hot chocolate. And stuff. <coughs> so, uh, yes. How does, what part of the development process gave you the biggest trouble? What part of the development progress gave you, <coughs> process gave you the biggest problem? Uh, I think the, the, the biggest original challenge was the storage of the vehicle into that very limited Rect uh, triangular envelope. Uh, the next biggest problem was the schedule to get all this done in 18 months. As far as technical problem, I think the wheel design was the biggest challenge because of the environmental uh, constraints on the moon. Uh, the wheel drive system was also a fairly serious developmental uh, problem, uh, not only because the temperature, but the lubrication problem. So, so what we ended up with is that we enclosed, hermetically sealed, the electric motor and gearbox combination, charged it with a half an atmosphere of nitrogen, so we could liquid lubricate the gears inside this environment. And to do that, we used uh, a gearbox uh, called a harmonic drive system, which, which, we, which we were capable of designing such a way that it, it was a complete hermetically sealed enclosure. 
I hope that uh, any future astronauts here have paid heed. Anyone who sets foot on the moon or Mars on any of the next missions is probably some kind of a student right now. So if you're a student, you might be one of the ones to go there. I'd like to remind you tomorrow morning from 7 till 8, the L-Cross impact here at the planetarium. And tomorrow afternoon at 3 in the afternoon in the Natural Science Building, we're going to have the Discovery Channel documentary with an informal discussion. We're uh, going to break now for uh, informal discussion outside over some uh, drinks and refreshments. And let's thank our speakers again.